Hi there, uh, my name is David Boswood and I'm from the Royal Agricultural University and I would like to welcome, uh, first of all, uh, Ben Thompson, uh, who's going to introduce himself. So Ben Thompson, I manage the Agritech Centre, Hartbury University and Hartbury College. Um, very much a background, personally, from in the practical farm management side, specifically in the ruminant sectors, um, from the breadth of South Wales all the way to Northern England as well. Um, I moved from there into research field, working on very topical issues such as antibi antibiotic resistance, workshops, working with farmers directly, looking at industry projects, uh, as well as very scientific projects as well. Um, and obviously a part of that revolved around use of technology as well, which obviously led me then to Heartbreed to steer and manage their new agri-tech centre here, very much focused on improving engagement to the latest technology as well as well as innovative, innovative practice for farmers both currently active uh, as well as the future generation covering our college and university students so uh, that's me okay thank you ben and now we've got james wright welcome james. Hi, so I'm, I'm james uh, i work for a company called breeder uh, i'm also a farmer myself um, so my wife and i are beef and sheep farmers uh, and then because that doesn't pay the bills, I work for a company called Breeder and Breeder run the Precision Livestock Network. Um, we have over 4000 farmers who use our app to measure and manage their livestock data. And um, and then uh, we also run a online marketplace and the world's first data driven um, beef contract. So farmers can get um, the top price of their cattle um, that they deserve. So, um, yeah, I think this is this this panel is right up, right, right up our street. OK, thank you. So, yes, as I said before, I'm David Boswood. Um, I uh, have a long history with technology and entrepreneurship and currently support uh, many businesses and, and students at the Royal Agricultural University and in the Cotswolds to start either agricultural businesses or technology businesses. So I welcome all the panellists. So, so first of all, we were going to uh, start to discuss things about um, first of all, the most important part when running a farm is the economic performance. So um, I thought what we'd do first is the economic performance is very much linked down to the management of the farm. So uh, first of all, Ben, can you uh, highlight some of the issues that you see that we're heading towards? Hmm. Heading towards, I'm going to steer, open up the can of worms of policy. Um, obviously going through agricultural transition plan over the next seven years and obviously phasing out of BPS payments. Um, that's probably getting our back more against the wall in the farming community in terms of now we're looking for avenues to become more efficient or productive um, and obviously getting ourselves a bit more off the page in how UK farming production is maybe as is obviously talked about in the media, having higher welfare standards, more sustainable practice. And it's trying to evidence that. And I talk a lot about, about that in relevance to technology in that it actually empowers these businesses uh, to get off the page a bit more, you know, whether they're doing things a bit more, what's deemed more sustainably or favorable for the environment or more productive generally. Um, these are things that need to be sort of at least uh, thought about if, if not already thought about, or at least pushed a bit further if you're already using technology already. So uh, yeah, absolutely. Business models are going to change, but I think this is going to be sort of a technological format to that um, because it just helps with the process. But yeah, um, sorry to open up the can of worms of policy, but yeah, obviously it's a massive change and obviously a buzzword in association with it is unprecedented, something we've used in the last 18 months already, haven't we? But uh, it's, it really is going to impact so many businesses, probably including James, but it'd be really interesting to hear his thoughts. Um, but yeah, I think uh, there's going to be a lot of decisions, key decisions to be made, a lot of big changes coming through, really. Anything to add, James? Yeah, I suppose spot on, really. The um, As a young farmer, there's going to be a lot of opportunities for people like me. But the reason why those opportunities are going to be there is because they're going to be a large number of um, existing farm businesses that are going to be unable to adapt and change. So uh, what we're effectively saying is, is that the current um, change in um, uh, strategy around basic payment to um, the environmental land management scheme is going to put a lot of farmers out of business. And um, the government and the DEFRA seems to be 
um, quite happy with that because the goal is to, um, you know, the outcomes are based around um, environmental outcomes. Fantastic um, and, and rightly needed, but then it's up to um, farmers um, like myself to work out how then you adapt and change your business um, to survive in that new landscape. And I suppose that's why we're here today. Yeah, so there's lots of research that shows that young farmers are more innovative, they're more adaptable, and they uh, are a lot more agile. Um, so I, I, I welcome that. But I think one of the things we, we're we're living in a time of big change and you know supermarket shelves are empty uh, petrol stations uh, have queues on them uh, we have ships being stuck in the Suez Canal uh, China's got electricity problems um, do you think it's the right time for them to start to, to think of that or do you think there's going to be additional changes because they're going to think oh maybe that's the wrong time and place to do it I'll chip in and say, I mean, it's easy to think that um, obviously it's, it's encouraging to see now more younger generations get into farming. And obviously, as James alluded to, it's, it's probably going to be a lot of opportunities for them to get into farming. But it's, it's easy to think that a lot of farmers are hesitant to change. Um, those that have been in farming for the last 30, 40 years are hesitant to change. Um, they've all overcome a lot of change. Obviously, technology is a change in itself. So it's natural to feel hesitant or new policies are changing itself. So it's naturally natural to feel and take a step back and think, whoa, hang on, what's going on here? Um, I think it's, it's yes, rightly so, James mentioned that there's going to be a lot of businesses that, that do are going to fall short. They're not going to be willing to change. Um, but there are the opportunity for those that are existing and have been for quite some time to continue to, to mould themselves into this sort of new marketplace, so to speak, but new eco economic opportunity as well um but i think yeah it is the right time because we've gone through a lot of change i think in the last 18 months we've almost been forced to use platforms like we are now um doing virtual sessions and uh, i think there's been study as well in that a lot of farmers have been open to using new virtual platforms to engage with whether advisors um or or other farmers so to speak and using societies and charities and representative bodies in the same way um but yeah it's encouraging i think it is the right time absolutely but when it when when would it be uh, it's going to be a shock either way isn't it yeah absolutely i don't i don't think we can afford not to um the changes that are coming down the track now um are all designed to uh, revert the um unsustainable biodiversity loss to restore um, nature um, in our countryside and also to, to combat climate change. And ultimately, David, if we don't actually change the way that we're farming to be more harmonious with our planet, we will have um, uh, uh, famine and um, uh, things like that forced upon us by, by climate change. I was at a lecture on Monday night um, that was saying that in um, 30 years, um, the south coast of England will have a climate like the south of France. And if you think about when I farm here already, is my business set up to farm like they do in the south of France? Well, no. So, um, you know, that would fund them. We'd have to look at irrigation, all sorts of things. And, and you know, th those are serious risks if we don't get a hand of the climate, the climate crisis. Yeah, I was talking to a, um, a, um, a wine merchant and a wine grower in, from South Africa, and they're buying land in England uh, because they reckon the climate's going to be about the same in a few years' time. So, yeah, uh, so different crops, different uh, business models. Um, let's just move on a little bit. But um, what we're seeing is that we're seeing that, that the introduction of, of new technology and, and sensors and apps and, and big data how do we think the, the business models are going to change uh, around the existing products that we're producing? Well, I, I think Breeda is a great example of, of that. So in our market, traditionally, um, farmers have to pay for, for livestock software. And we give farmers the ability to manage um, their livestock data um, for free. And then the way that, way that we make money is, is that farmers use our marketplace, our deadweight contracts, and our financing tools, and then we take a commission 
um, as, as those uh, as they use them and lots of our members don't but many of our, us do and actually that brings in more income for us than if we were charging a monthly or an annual fee and I think you'll see many more tools like us with different business practices I think the fact that a lot of software um, you know traditionally farming has been very much based around physical locations so for example um, machinery dealers or um, you know universities um, places of learning, markets, vets, they've all been based around physical locations. And with that, there's quite a high um, running cost. But when you look at software, um, we are based in the cloud. And, um, and, and that means our running costs are much lower. Um, Breeder doesn't have an office. Um, we have 30 staff that work for us, but we all work from home. And I think um, you'll see many new companies come along like ours, where they are able to offer a service to a farmer for less than the current status quo does and that will really um you know disrupt and shake up the farming industry for the benefit of the farmer because you're not tied into somebody who's near you just because they're near you you'll get the best service the the best product available for you um because of the internet which is really exciting i think everyone should be excited about that uh, ben yeah, I think um, I, I can. I'll talk a bit broadly. I think I think I agree with James. There's going to be a lot more solutions coming through. There's there's a lot of opportunities and challenges associated with technology. Obviously, it depends on the perspective. It depends on whether you're coming from the farmer side as a user side, or whether from the business side. But um, I think some of the common challenges is that things don't talk to each other digitally. Um, obviously, we're coming through in now to a, a more digital world, and more and more solutions are coming through, which just to be honest, adds to the, let's say, the shop window. So from a farmer's perspective, let's say a challenge, it's they're just seeing all these different solutions in the shop window, whether it's something currently in research, something that could be five, ten years from becoming available, all the way to things like James and Breeder that are available and farmers can use and adopt now. Now, in a time-constraint world that farming is anyway, you want to really invest if it is a little bit of time to consider what technology is going to be best for you, you want to invest that time into things that are going to be available or are and proven and viable for, let's say, UK producers. Um, I can speak from my own personal perspective. And then if I talk to farmers and they say, well, I've used this and I've got good benefits coming from that, 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 that rumor spreads far quicker than any marketing strategy, uh, especially in farming communities anyway. So it's just trying to encourage that, really, and just trying to ca categorize those technologies into what's available now, what to look out for. But then, obviously, there's the, there's the sort of things and contingencies you need to sort of be prepared for, and that you need to ask the questions, OK, where's this data going? Is that sustainable? Is that a sustainable investment for me and my business, uh, which not you know, everyone does? at this. Obviously, in this current scenario, technology is a new thing, so it's easy to think, okay, that's a great product, whether in manufacture, it's a company we trust, but it's now to look at not just the physical landscape, which we do in previous investment, but also look at the digital landscape as well. So if I invest in this company, are they able to share my data from this, my, this enterprise, this enterprise, or share my data with this, this processor or this other person? Uh, that's going to be increasingly important uh, because eventually that's where everyone's going to end up is they're able to know where their data is going, but also it's shared uh, sort of freely and very efficiently as well. So um, I could go on and on about challenges as well as opportunities, but um, yeah, there's obviously a lot of things to be uncovered, but ultimately, um, yeah, we're going to be moving into a more digital world and it involves people using data for better practice and that's going to be coming through in farming as well. Because, uh, you know, I think one of the examples that James would probably say is things about when you, where you're selling cattle through the app, the, the details of, of that cow moves from one owner to another owner. And, um, and that, that transfer of data is one of the, the key issues when you, when we talk about provenance and when we talk about, you know, I want to buy a loaf of bread and I want to know that that wheat was grown in the UK and has been produced in the UK and hasn't been mixed up with other types of wheat from other places. I think, yeah. when you mentioned, I think when you mentioned, sorry, about um, provenance, it's what I commonly say to students at Hartbury and other, and other farmers, it's all about empowering your business. 
to say, you know, I do it this way. I talked about it before. You know, I do this more efficiently. I'm more sustainable. And it's just gathering more data into that pool, really. Typically, I could probably say in the past that a lot of data just ended up going off farm, but didn't in return benefit the farmer. Um, so there's probably numerous projects. Um, James is probably aware of a few that the data just ended up just going away from the farm, which would have been ideal. I describe it as marketable data for them and their produce or the way that their farms managed. Yet it just went somewhere else. But technology on farm technology is able to provide that data back and for them to empower that business to say, OK, we're doing this this way, which obviously could be more favorable in policy. Um, so, yeah, it's exciting times. I, I, it's really important, as Ben says, that a uh, uh, breeder, we believe the farmer owns the data. So we only provide the platform where the farmer is able to store that data. And we do do some stuff with that data to help everyone in the breeder network. But fundamentally, the farmer is the one who's recording it. They've gone to the effort. They own that data. And I and I think this democratization of data is, is that and I think it's happening that farmers realize their data is valuable and they want to protect it. And if we take the example, David, that you brought up at the beginning about buying and selling cattle, um, when you buy cattle on, on breeder, for example, the medical history moves with it. So you can see that that animal has had the right vaccinations, that it was wormed four weeks ago. So you don't need to worm it. And because the selling farmers records are all linked up as part of the red tractor inspections, they know um, that the cattle they're buying have had those medicines. But we need to see that in other industries. We need to see that in um, crop protection. Why do we still have um, paper passports? You know, what are the, um, the, crop, uh, the crop companies doing around protecting that? You could have a digital record for a field and you could have its spray applications, the cultivations, what fertilizers it had. And when you sell that crop, you if you're selling it off the field and not going into a store you could give an idea of what that farm you know what that field has produced or you could have an average for the farm across everything they've produced and that technology is all there it just hasn't quite been joined up yet and you know those are the sorts of really exciting things that will be coming along in the next decade or so all for the benefit of the farmer because ultimately they'll be able to charge a higher price because they'll be able to um, verify and show why their crop is better than somebody else's and why they should be rewarded for that. Which brings us on to productivity. Um, so all this uh, data can help you um, show your productivity, uh, benchmark your productivity and ultimately understand the business dynamics that you've got uh, on the farm. And of course, it is very, very difficult to compare one farm with another farm um, and one set of cattle to another set of cattle. But I see, you know, as part of the government's policy, they are starting to go down that route of being able to understand what it is that um, we are doing in, on our farms and, and how we are trying to uh, develop the environment around the farms um, but I also think that productivity uh, especially when associated with international trade is one of the things where uh, as a as an independent country outside Europe uh, we, we may need to be a little bit more savvy about so how do you think that uh, international trade and especially when we do look at farmers who um, some of the farming organisations do come out with some protectionism type strategies. Uh, what do you think about that? I think in, ter well, in terms of trade, it goes back to empowering businesses. But until, in terms of benchmarking, we're all looking to environmental land management schemes and obviously waiting for the finer terms. And then I'll be obviously be able to see where you mentioned about every farm being different. Um, obviously, they've set about the, the, the different schemes, whether nature recovery, habitat recovery or the sustainable farming incentive, which has obviously received um, the much news so far. But it's knowing then, OK, based on the natural resources I have on my farm or, or the enterprises I run, which do I align to better? Obviously, we're waiting for the finer terms to then farmers to benchmark, hence the pressure on uh, what these terms are going to be, what's going to be asked and how that data can be easily captured. And so how can it be merged into my current model or day-to-day -day practice? I talk about sort of evolved farm management is what we're coming through to now, is how can we efficiently capture that data that's going to be seen more favourable um, or 
being asked of us to capture. Um, and it's difficult. Uh, it very much is difficult. But, uh, yeah, I think in terms of trade, it's um, you've got to give a bit to get a bit back, definitely, uh, which, is a, which isn't easy. Um, definitely not. But I think going back to my earlier point about UK being biased, um, as we can all be here today, is obviously getting across that individual businesses are doing, are meeting those higher welfare standards and by what scale. Um, we're almost after some sort of overarching protocol um, and that comes into the sort of greenhouse gas protocol and the carbon footprint audit. Which do you follow? You know, who do you follow? And where do I position myself based on the enterprises I have? And currently we've got multiple different audits you can follow on that regard. But then, you know, therefore you're going to have different different perspectives. But for individual businesses to follow, who it's, it's very difficult to do that. Um but yeah, in terms of trade, it's all just about getting across how you're different and becoming more competitive. Why is the UK different? You know, why why are we getting across more data to align with sort of higher audits, I think, is is the way to go. And I, I only explain that the only way to get there efficiently is with adopt well, adopting technology and that being implemented successfully across the board, whether you're small scale, small holder, or whether you're a very large scale intensity farm business. So um, yeah, it's it's difficult. It's a waiting game currently, I think. I, I'm going to disagree with Ben because I don't think it is for the government or for industry to come in and say, look, this is the international standard you've got to follow and this is the regulatory stuff you've got to do and then you can access new markets if you do that awful sort of stuff. I'm a, I'm a real free marketeer and I think most farmers are as well. Um, you know, I think it's for farmers and individuals to come up with those products and services. And let's take, for example, meat eating quality in the UK. Um, we buy and sell um, our livestock um, based on well, we sell our livestock to the abattoirs based on meat quantity indicators. So we have the Europe grid, which you get as a farmer paid on weight and then it's graded on confirmation and fat class if you go to australia to america and japan they buy and sell their livestock based on quality they have marbling indicators or they have grass fed in america they have prime select and choice and those aren't you get a farmer gets paid on weight but also they get paid on the quality grading it's not done on fat class and um farmers could wait the next 10 15 years for the abattoirs and supermarkets to get behind that or there are many farmers going out there and developing their own supply chains and working with camera technology in the abattoir to um, grade the animals. And, um, you know, this is both large scale, so thousands of animals, but also small scale farmers, too. And I, and I think we really should be encouraging people like that, not expecting, you know, Red Tractor 2.0 to do that for us. I think farmers really need to, you know, get get hold of the, get hold of this opportunity um, and, 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 and work together. And that's the other thing as well is, is that you don't have to do this alone. And that's, I'm in a couple of WhatsApp groups with farmers and they're all really entrepreneurial and they're all working together. So, you know, one might say, well, my kill pattern is in the autumn, so I'll supply the grass fed stuff then. You do the spring because you're in a different climate, you're in the island southwest rather than north, northeast or whatever. And then they together they can come up, they can make it work. So I, I you know, I, I think it's for farmers and businesses to come up with that sort of stuff, not necessarily wait for the industry to do it for them. No, I, th I think it's a balance, uh, very much so. Some things I think some of the best industry can come, some of the best ideas and innovation can come from anywhere. So I, I actively take part in showcasing what agriculture is doing to, to urban events or talking, with, talking to telecommunications companies, for example, and hearing about what they're doing, working in transport, what technology they're using, because there's transferables. So whether it's something that's already widespread, that doesn't have to come from government or larger policy or large organizations or representative bodies, completely agree with you in that it could be industry led. You know, a farmer could come up with an absolutely amazing idea or want to showcase what they're doing and why it's different. Absolutely. But there's some cases where being I think there's a risk with that being solely the case that you can become a bit naive to think, OK, there could be some other information that I wasn't aware of um, that could contribute to that. Um, so it's just being open, I think, um, to work with all different industries or different people with new ideas. 
Um, I think I do agree, though, farmers, farmer led innovation. I certainly talk to a lot of farmers that um, that have got the next best idea, want to work on community groups, like you mentioned, James. Um, but I think it's a mixture, very much so. It's just being open to wherever the new idea or great idea can come from uh, to support businesses, really. Okay, so let's let's move forward a little bit forward uh, further to um, talk about the environment and measuring the environment. So um, this for me is, is going to be a difficult one because I think um, there's so many different parameters to measuring the environment. Uh, and I, I know that politicians can only think of one thing at a time. And so um, just measuring one thing in the environment is never going to be the right way. So what should we be measuring, do you think? I resent that, Ben, uh, David, because I am uh, a lo in lo involved in local politics. And I think if we let's just take my context here. And I think um, the government's doing their environmental bill at the moment. Um, it's the 25 year environmental plan and it's been in the works for years. Um, but that should be approved before Christmas. And in that it talks about how um, every local authority will have to have a nature recovery plan. And how um, and in my district, we've actually got a nature recovery plan. We've already done it. But that then allows farmers to engage with organisations like the local council who have money for these projects, the wildlife trusts who want to work with farmers. Um, and, and then you can then. So what they're doing is they're biodiversity scoring farms and the farmers then get given a plan and then they can work out how funding can be attached to their plan. That's local, local. That's not even SFI or realms. And, the, and that will be happening across the UK. So how, that, do you, how do you measure that? How are they going to measure that? OK, they're going to give you some money. And but and OK, and 25 years is the wrong amount of time, because in 25 years time, we were what we know about the environment today will be that much. And in 25 years now, we're going to be more, more. So having something that's going to run for 25 years is just crazy daisy. But how if they're going to give you some money for your farm, how are they going to know that they, they can walk around the farm? Yeah. But what data could they say they're going to collect to say, actually, we are regenerating or we are yeah. doing something good here? Exactly. And if you look at the countryside stewardship schemes that happen at the moment, it's done around photos. So you have planted some trees, take a photo. Um, whereas actually it should be about outcomes. So it should be, um, you know, you have um, put in skylark pl plots in your fields and you've, um, you know, had 10 skylark nests appear. That's really, really expensive to uh, record and manage. So how can we use things like satellite mapping? How can we use things like training farmers to monitor it themselves? Um, that's why we love cluster groups. There's a cluster group here. Um, but the data part of it is, is, is really interesting. I mean, um, there's a great company called um, the Land App, um, which I know have been working on a trial with, um, uh, with, with uh, the RPA around how they use their software to work with um, local organisations like FWAG, so the Farm and Wildlife Action Group, and using the Land App um, software to monitor and manage um, the impacts it's having on the ground but you're right David we need to work out how we can automate this um, but obviously every farm is different and one solution that works for mine might not work for a farm near Ben so it's it's really tricky there's not an easy answer I don't think I'm afraid yeah I, I think there's there's so much you can measure I think there was it was announced that you'll be rewarded based on soil health and obviously the immediate response to that then is okay what do you want to measure because there's so much going on in the soil, what would deem would you deem more favourable? Um, what would you deem more environmentally friendly? Plus the the carbon sequester argument is that you know, like you said, James mentioned about taking pictures that I planted some trees or I haven't done anything with hedgerows for the X number of years. What's the environmental impact to that in real? You know, getting that in real time is you know is the tricky bit. You know, having a predictive model based on research is can be obtained, but in terms of knowing the output in real time to empower those businesses or collective groups of farmers is, is going to be the, is going to be the difficult one because there's so many things you, do, you can measure. Um, but I think, yeah, it's, it's looking at what needs to be looked at, uh, what's deemed more favorable and then having predictive models in the, in, in the first instance, but then after which I think once let's say data science catches up, once technology comes a bit more prominent in that area, 
um, you'll be able to have a bit more informed insight as a farmer to maybe look at and say, okay, today, based on the, you know this last month, I'm this part carbon positive or this much carbon negative. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a can of worms sort of scenario in that it's very difficult to know what should I go after first? What should I measure? Um, I think it's just looking at fundamental categories to start to start off with and just allowing farmers to look at their natural resources like James mentioned, everyone's different. Everyone's going to benefit in different ways. Um, I reside in Wales, even though I'm based in Gloucestershire, uh, with work. Obviously, farming country is different from, it could be from a stone's throw away in terms of even just from soil type. So therefore, you're going to have different impact on the environment in that case as well. So it's going to be difficult. But I think uh, it's going to be a transition, as obviously what's mentioned in policy. And the, th the other thing as well, we we're going to start to measure um, what's happening on a farm. But farmland is just one part of the area and, and things like streams. Um, we, we could do something on the farm to support the stream and support the water quality, but actually it's really the downstream issues that we're trying to protect and we're trying to measure i.e flooding and things like that so uh, how, how do we start to look at the farm and its impact outside but also there's plenty of other things happening outside the farm that impact the farm so you could be doing some great stuff on the farm but because of other factors out of the farm it could be taking that away so you could end up not being paid money but you could be doing the right thing yeah, and, and that goes back to farmers can't do the right thing by the environment if they're not um, making money. And that's the big concern um, with the loss of basic payment. Um, how many farmers will um, take out the hedgerows, will fill in the ponds, will make their fields bigger, um, just take on more acreage? rather than engaging with the new um, environmental schemes, then I think you've underlined a really good point, David, is, is that these schemes don't work and the outcomes don't work if the farmer isn't making money. Um, and at a time of, um, you know, food um, in instability with the fuel crisis, with energy price increases, um, does do, do food prices need to increase to pay for the true cost of food? You know, at the moment, um, Farmers are subsidising the cheap food that the consumer wants and needs um, at the cost of the environment. And does food need to um, increase in price? But in 2019, before the pandemic, 600,000 people used a food bank in the UK. Um, mm. Some of those would have used it more than once. So at the same time, there are people in the UK who literally can't afford to eat. Yet at the same time, as a country, we can't afford for people not to pay the true cost of food because otherwise we're just damaging the environment. And, and, and that's why you need that joined up think, thinking. And I really liked Henry Dimbleby, Dimbell's um, report, um, the National Food Strategy, um, and how that's going to inform future government policy. Because, you know, it's true, you need to have that joined up picture so that the farmer is making enough money so he can care about the woodland. So the woodland provides habitat for the, for the insects that then feed the birds and that then look after the waterways and the whole ecosystem. But if a farmer isn't making money, none of that can happen. Ben, you're an you know, I think it goes it goes back to the point where um, I'll give an example. Someone growing wheat, um, heavily ploughed land with not heavily ploughed land. Comparison of the two farmers, they both get the same price um, in some cases. So what's the reward there? One's obviously more considered more beneficial to the environment, uh, less disturbance to soil health. One is. Um, but I think um, I think it's, it's difficult, but I think, yeah, absolutely, economics need to be in favour. You know, ultimately, it's a business decision to, to look at the environmental impact. You know, farmers are professional caretakers for the environment and natural resources. It's part of our assets. You know, it's part of the business. Um, so therefore, it needs to be considered a, a business decision when we're looking at making changes to that based on our current practice. But um, yeah, economics need to be in favour. Like I, I agree with, I agree with James. Absolutely. It needs to be in favour um, and obviously work side by side with the new policy for environmental impact. Uh, but yeah, there needs to be, a, there needs to be a window of opportunity because 
ultimately in farming, it's a game of risks in some cases. Some things are just completely out of your control. So yeah. it's not just an easy business decision. You know, one of the biggest things is the weather, you know. Um, so one of the things you just cannot control in broad acre farming. Um, but I think it's just, yeah, it's getting control of those risks, but making sure there's a window, op- there's provided a window opportunity, which I think needs to happen with the new ELM scheme for every farm to think, well, okay, this is a nice window opportunity for me and I'm going to reward it on this fact. Um, but it's just being able to look at the straight and narrow bottom line benefit, you know, and being able to summarize that quite efficiently as a business owner. Um, but yeah, it's going to be difficult. But yeah, the op- definitely the economics need to favor and obviously provide the window, really. So we've got, we all agree that the economics need to be right. Um, an economic basis always provides the opportunity for long term planning and long term planning normally um, provides the opportunity to look after the environment because uh, that can only be done in the long term uh, by regenerating the soil and developing it but also outside the farm we you know farms are not in isolation um, in all sorts of ways but we normally farms have a community around them and I think one of the the things that we forget is is the farm and the farmer is part of a, a community, a, a rural community, and they're central to that rural community. And I actually think we should be measuring that as well, because I think that's a community benefit that sometimes goes uh, unnoticed. I know my local farmer is always getting people out the, uh, the hedgerow when they're being drunk and driving uh, too fast down a, a snowy lane. And, you know, he he never asks for any money for that. So there's lots of benefit that we see that farms provide the local community. So should we be measuring that as well? I would say yes, absolutely. I mean, three times a day, 365 days a year, you rely on a farmer. Um, That's that's the blunt facts. You know, you need everyone needs food. Um, It's great to see farming. Um, I can speak on an educational perspective now. Just come off, you know, come off and you know, being open to all the different opportunities involved in agriculture, whether on farm or off farm. And to be honest, that invites everyone to get involved. Um, Obviously, a lot of people highlight agriculture for negative reasons, um, but really it's part, it's largely part of the solution. Um, Absolutely. And it's just about waking up to that, really. Um, And that impacts everyone. So whether you're part of that small community, small village, um, all, all the way part to, you know, in urban areas, everyone needs to probably get on board with the fact that farmers have got the biggest opportunity or agriculture has got the biggest opportunity to, to come, come against larger agendas, you know, the climate crisis, et cetera, um, which is, is gradually getting there. I reckon so definitely. Um, but yeah, I think uh, I can speak on behalf of living in a small community. Um, you know, farmers are in touch with small communities all the time. They're all the sort of living, living breath really of it all. Um so, yeah, it's nice, but I think, yeah, it does, they do need to be rewarded on that fact as well, definitely. Yeah, I, I think, um, I don't think it would be so far to go too far to say that I think farming and rural communities are under under threat from all sorts of things. And as we take more money out of these communities by removing the basic payment and more money flows in from places like the city you know having good internet in your village is like a it's a double-edged sword because it means you can watch netflix but it also means the banker that once lived in london can have a holiday home in your village or maybe his family comes and lives in the village and they work in london and um that that is a double-edged sword because it it, it basically we're gentrifying or urbanizing the countryside. And it means people like um, me and young farmers like me, we, we have to go and live in the towns to then work in the countryside. And we rent the land off the person who now lives in the house that once probably a generation ago, I would have lived in. And there are all of these really difficult socioeconomical problems that are going on that we're really not dealing with at the moment, but we will have to. Because like you say, David, um, is uh, am I going to have be able to rescue that person from the hedgerow um, if I'm in the local village rather than living on the farm? Is, is the person who lives in the farmhouse going to come out and rescue them? No, probably not. So um, it is really, really tricky. 
and we really do need to get to grips with this problem. But I think at the heart of it, it comes back to um, uh, profitability. And if your farm is not profitable, you do not have the time to do all the other stuff. You know, um, recently we had a fire on the farm and everyone in the local community came out and helped us. But the only way they were able to come out and help us is because they were safe at home, that there was enough money in the bank and all this sort of stuff. And if you're if everyone in the farming community is on the edge, we can't help each other. And so it's so important that that government and the policymakers realise that in order to have a strong, healthy rural commun community, farmers need to be profitable and we need to work out how we make farmers profitable whilst making sure that we produce food that we sequester carbon that we hit all the biodiversity things we need to do so that's really it's a really really important point okay. i think on the flip side it's it's education as well i mean it's, it's a big drive and a lot of people talk about education and obviously being more aware of how food is produced what's going on as well as the career opportunities in agriculture and um, what farmers are doing what goes on in terms of practice um, there's still a lot of work to be done um, you know, improving that insight from, let's say, your James's example from the banker. Um, you know, if he had a bit more insight, maybe into understanding farming practice, he might maybe want to be a bit more involved. Uh, like I said, I think um, it's great to obviously have communities that are able to help. In James's case, with the local with the fire, um, but I think they could be doing more than that. Um, definitely, uh, they could be playing their own part as maybe as part of living in that community. So, in 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 turn, actually benefiting the farmer um you know in, in a task that probably been done by james so there's probably ways in which you can improve the education improving let's say the insight that as part of this community helping farming businesses around the area also helps you in your living environment um so i think it's the educational piece maybe as well that could help i should say one of my landlords is a banker and he's very involved and very helpful so i uh, <laughs> should, should caveat that this is not all like that um but no Okay, right. Um, I think we're coming towards the end now. So uh, let's go around the room and just have a few passing comments. Last comments from firstly, Ben, please. Yeah, it's exciting as well as um, daunting, uh, naturally, what we're going to go through in the next, let's say, new policy, what we're asked to do in terms of farming communities. But in terms of exciting nature, it's, it's it, under the heading of opportunities. It's all the exciting things that can be. we can now measure be a part of that the spotlight isn't always negative i would say um the spotlight can also be very good for agriculture it's highlighting uh, the hard work um that's the, the high welfare standards the environmental impact the opportunity the responsibility we have as an industry uh, which is really key um, so it's about making the most of that spotlight i think but uh, making sure we can follow the right path Hopefully this uh, discussion gets off, you know, to, to many different ears and encourages ripples to, to contribute to the challenges and issues that we've raised as well, really. So, yeah, it's been great to be a part. James? Yeah, I mean, there are so many changes going on in farming in the next um, uh, 10 years. And I think it's great that there are organisations like the RAU, um, like, like Hartbury um, University and then companies like Breeder, there are lots of us out there that are looking to support farmers and, and make farmers more profitable so that they can adapt to these changes. And, you know, I'm, I think although there is lots of change coming, um, you know, I think I'm feeling very positive about it. Um, maybe that's just because I'm thinking about all the land that I can hoover up. Um, from the businesses that, that can't change. But no, I, I think there is a real opportunity here um, for, for farmers to make money, whether it be being paid to rewild your farm and you retire or, um, you know, running a rotational beef business that's going around arable farms, restoring carbon to the soils and getting paid for that. So there are loads and loads of opportunities coming down the track. And I think it's up to us to make sure that um, everyone's got the tools to be able to make that change. OK, and um, I always remember Gordon Brown had a, a motto, what gets measured gets done. And um, I'm just very cautious that policy make makers um, may not want to measure the right things and uh, they would, might not measure. You know, we've talked about economic performance, we've talked about the environment and we've talked about the community engagement. And for me, they're all very, very important things that are just also worthy of him of measuring rather than just soil health or water quality. They're all very, very important. And therefore, um, while many farmers would probably hate me for saying we should measure everything, um, we just need to be a little bit more cautious about 
what do we measure and let's be a little bit more holistic in in measuring those things so um, I, I agree with uh, James and Dan in the sense that there's lots of opportunities education is always at the center of it and uh, I think we we certainly were going to have a, a very entrepreneurial time in the next 10 years within agriculture so I thank you for listening and I wish you all well and see you in the future bye bye